Hello, my name's Neville Hodgkinson, and um, I've been a practitioner of meditation and spiritual understanding for many years. And um, in this introductory class about um, meditation and spirituality, I want to share something of the benefits that can come about from change of outlook that gradually develops in you when you take these things into your everyday life. And I called it a taste of freedom because it really is like that. When I began meditating some 35, 37 years ago, uh, I was working in a newspaper office, very hard driven and um, lots of ups and downs, and it was exhausting me. And uh, almost immediately, I found that um, introducing some reflective moments into my life made a difference so that I enjoyed the second half of my career much more than the first, where I was better able to manage my mind and my feelings. And so this is the taste of freedom that I'm referring to in um, explaining something of, of uh, what this spiritual understanding entails. I would say that I feel very fortunate that I came across what I regard as a very simple and yet powerful way of understanding oneself better and bringing that understanding into everyday life. It's really at its core, it has the understanding that each one of us is in our intrinsic being, we are peace, we are positive qualities like love and joy. Those are intrinsic to the human. And when you see an innocent young child playing, we all recognize that joy that is in that child. And um, we look on it with pleasure and perhaps some wistfulness because we may not always have held on to those same qualities in our, in our own lives. And this, um, this understanding that um, I'm sharing something about it has two prongs to it, really. One is to re-experience that, um, that or those original qualities. It's like a, you have to taste something before you can know what it is. It's like you couldn't possibly describe the taste of a carrot without actually having eaten a carrot. You might say something of its texture and all the rest of it, but you have to taste it to know it. And it's the same with, uh, with this practice. So, two aims in this introductory session. One is to have a taste of the freedom and the joy that comes with that, with this understanding that we are at root, these beings of these very positive qualities and that the, the worries and the negativities and the sorrows that afflict us are not intrinsic to life. Many people feel that perhaps that is life, you know, that it's going to be a mixture. Well, perhaps in today's world it is, but but it doesn't have to be like that. And we know, and I know from my own experience, that I've greatly reduced the amounts of stress and tension that I suffer and greatly increased the periods of time where I feel as if that original truth is lived in my, my own life. So we can change and the world can change. While I think of it, I want to share with you a definition of meditation that I came across recently, which is that it goes like this, through silence, allowing eternal truths to make you well. That is also extraordinarily simple, but and very simple language. But of course, it begs the question, what are these eternal truths? And um, I would say that these eternal truths have to do with these qualities these uh, qualifications that lie at the root of our being, of being able to live with generosity of spirit, with happiness, being able to make molehills out of mountains when problems come in front of us, being able to forgive and move on when unpleasant things have happened. And these are ancient understandings um, in the Lord's Prayer in, um, in Christianity. I remember it goes... Um, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. It's a very the old language of trespassing. You know, normally these days we only see trespasses will be prosecuted. But the, that prayer contained the idea that 
you can trespass on someone else's happiness. You can take something from them by being thoughtless or egotistical or whatever. And so, so it contains that recognition that we do sometimes trespass on one another's happiness. And, and this practice is aimed at teaching us how to lessen our vulnerability to the insults that might come from others so that we don't let them destroy our happiness. And also through that charging of the battery of our own well-being, being much less liable to trespass on another's happiness. So you see how practical and valuable these, these aims are. So how do we go about it? Well, as I mentioned, the first step is, is or at least two steps that move in tandem to experience that you are this. And um, that is, there's a bit of a chicken and egg to this because we have, many of us have had so many experiences of frustration and sorrow that it feels as if those are absolutely a part of everyday life, but they don't have to be. Uh, they're not an eternal truth. They're something temporary that is like obscures this underlying beauty to life. And, um, and along with that experience, just this understanding that we are not actually primarily physical beings. And this is a big one because most of the governmental policies, the entreaties of advertisers to buy their products, even most of science today with its focus on mastering the material world, all of these factors encourage us to think of ourselves as primarily physical beings who might develop some a mind as, as a result of the complexity of the brain, for example. But there is a different way of thinking about this, which is absolutely key to being able to restore your freedom. And that is to understand that you're not primarily a material being. You are primarily an individuated consciousness or soul using the, the ancient language. It's actually quite a, a, a novel thing, you know, in, in for maybe the last 150 years that more and more people have dismissed the idea of soul. I saw an exhibition about Shakespeare's world a little while back, and it was completely taken for granted back in the 16th century that we were souls. The debates were about what happened to you after you died, but it was absolutely fully understood that we had that eternal aspect to us. So a part, of, um, a part of this course is about recovering the understanding that it's not irrational, it's not unscientific to recognize that at the core of your being, there is this energy of consciousness. When you regain that understanding, it puts you back in the driver's seat of your life, your brain, of your thoughts and your feelings. This was one of the biggest things that I experienced when I first began this study, that I have a, the opportunity to make choices about how I think and feel. So, for example, if some angry feelings are coming up because I was being asked by the news editor to do something that I didn't want to do, I could snip that reaction and stop it kind of taking me over viscerally and emotionally and physiologically, I could do that. I discovered that I could make that choice. And then in the coolness that would follow, I might be able to have a rational discussion why I felt it was best not to do this. Or he might persuade me that it was best. So you can see how immediate um, this sort of self-mastery can bring, how immediately it can bring benefits into your everyday life, as it did with me. So. I want to now just say a little bit more about this aspect of, of the self as a being of individuated consciousness. Science itself is now at its frontiers working with an understanding that the material world is secondary to a world which is described as a, in, in what they call the consciousness-based paradigm, a kind of matrix that is informational. There's an immense complexity. We think we're clever at um, creating memory sticks that contain whole libraries. But 
it's as if nature has a mind within which there's a massive amount of information about how the, how things are going to unfold in our in our everyday lives and that that beauty and complexity is at a mental or spiritual level it's not actually something that is externalized the the material world that we see is a consequence of of the information that lies at that deeper level so there's a there's a you can feel comfortable that you're not abandoning your intellect you're not abandoning even common sense by allowing yourself to recognize that there could be much more to you than generally we acknowledge that the mind is fundamental to who you are and if the mind the way you find yourself expressing it at the moment is not always allowing you to feel happiness if it's sometimes driving you to behave in ways that you feel are not how you, they're not in line with your deeper truth then that's where this meditation and spiritual understanding and the practice and study of it can be so useful so i'm just going to give you a little flavor of how how we might might work with this there's some um, what i might do when i'm especially now because i've been practicing this for many years i can jump quite quickly into this inner awareness and now i come out and deal with things in an everyday sense like everybody else does but fairly regularly not as often as i should but fairly regularly i go back inside and reconnect with with this inner beauty and uh but before you've developed the knack of doing that it can help there are some certain steps that help you along the way and one of the first is probably rather similar to uh, what you might call what is commonly nowadays called mindfulness that came out of the buddhist tradition and mindfulness entails coming into the present the present awareness you might have your eyes half open you become very present to yourself to the world around you you realize that in my case there's some lights there's a camera there are some people in the room there are some others at the end of the line there are some sounds that i can hear some people walking past the river that's outside the place where i'm sitting there's a movement of a cup of a of breathing my own breathing i'm aware of that i'm i'm present and i'm not i'm deliberately choosing not to think about the past or the future i'm coming right into the present moment this is a necessary step because otherwise when you try to connect with the inner being you may find that your thoughts your brain or the neural circuitry is crowding out these this still small voice from within so coming into the present moment is a useful first step and then it's very useful to go inside to become aware of a kind of center of consciousness a sort of interface between this unit of consciousness that i am and that each one of us is and the material of the brain and the body and the way we do that the way we come into that sort of focused self awareness is to think of the self as residing in a space just an inch or two behind the center of the forehead so that you're actually coming into a you're you're aware of your brain you're aware of your body but you are considering that this is the seat of the soul if you like the interface between this non-physical and eternal dimension of your being and the material world of brains and bodies which are here today and gone tomorrow so i come into that inner awareness of the self as that being of light a being of a kind of wisdom a being of positive vibrational energy and it's much easier for me to do that when i am present when i am not allowing worries to intrude on my consciousness
and this is the very beginning but it's the beginning of a journey that takes you more and more into the almost unlimited potential of the inner self the inner being it's a potential that allows you when you move away from material consciousness into this sense of the subtle being that each one of us is you also feel a sense of connectedness you're yourself but your mind can reach out beyond your brain not just through memory but actually in a very real way you can feel a sense of connectedness to other people other souls other other creatures and in fact all of the whole of creation so there are many practical benefits that follow from this kind of experience i've mentioned how when i come into this awareness my own higher nature starts to be able to be expressed i become more resilient in relationships with others i become more giving but also even my own practice will help others you know when i can be peaceful when others are all stressing out it's an amazing gift it might not be recognized but people will feel the the the, the strength of it you're really helping in difficult circumstances and even the planet you know which we it's widely acknowledged now that the planet is under a lot of strain its climate the nuclear threat the food food um, difficulties the interrelatedness of everything but also the the non-sustainability of our present approaches to economy and the environment even these things will will come right if we put our minds right so this is this is the promise of this um of this practice and this spiritual understanding so i think i'll leave it there now for the moment uh, with these introductory words and part of the idea of this webinar is to talk to some others here and um, see if any questions are arising at this point so perhaps um, i could now invite those questions Is there an opportunity for people to call in as well? Yes. That can also happen. So if anybody would like to call in who's watching, you're very welcome to do that. Could I perhaps ask a question? <clears throat> how, how long would one need to meditate on a daily basis if one was starting to begin to feel the benefits come through? Would how? it be a question of um, changing your lifestyle totally, or would it just be a little at the beginning? How long would one need to meditate um, in order to feel benefits coming through? Is it, yes. is it something that can happen immediately? Is it just a beginning? What's needed to see substantial change? It's a great question. My own experience in this area is that some benefits were immediate and others have taken a long time to be experienced. I found in my case that um, there were, as I've already intimated, there were enormous benefits in my workplace immediately. I remember actually, um, when I, I worked for some years as medical correspondent on the Sunday Times, and I remember when I went for the interview for that job, I wasn't sure whether to speak to the panel of senior guys doing the interviews about this spiritual practice. But I decided, well, it's important to me, so I must. And it's almost like it got me the job because I remember them saying, is there something that can help us with our stress, you know? <laughs> and um, I think I, I did see a huge difference between my years at the previous newspaper that I'd worked for, where, which was before I'd started practicing these things, and my years at the Sunday Times, where it was sort of coming more and more on board. And I was just better able to listen to colleagues, to support them when they were in need, to see ways through things rather than, you know, making flames of anger and so forth worse. I could call things. 
there were a lot of benefits immediately in the workplace for me. I also saw immediate benefits at a family level with my, my sons um, who um, were only about 12 and 13 when I started this. So there was a lot of uh, discussion around it in the home. And I think they took a lot of benefit from my seeing them more from a perspective of a parent who wanted to give rather than I think sometimes we have neediness built into our relationships with children. You know, you're trying to live through them and maybe some of the things that you missed in your own childhood, you're, you're hoping that they might receive. That may not be a bad thing, but sometimes parents, this helicopter parenting, they call it, you know, that the, the, the parent is so um, hovering over the child as not to allow them to flourish in the way that they need to flourish. It's more like the ideas that the parent have. And I feel that these practices brought immediate benefit in that context, that um, our sons, instead of my living through them, I was living for them much more. The, um, the other things that took me much longer were really coming to terms with, um, with my own more hidden areas where you could say I didn't have freedom. And in that, in that context, I'm referring to things like um, ego drives and attachment, um, where attachment is often in today's world thought to be a good thing. You know, you're attached to something, it means perhaps that you love it, but it's different. What I found is that in my close personal relationships, there was attachment and dependency, but these practices have, as they've gradually charged this inner battery, I've become um, much less needy in those relationships and more giving. And that's beautiful to see. And um, whereas I feel that some of my close relationships were in trouble before I started these practices, they've come right since I took this strength inside. So these things work in a very practical way. So there's time for one more question before we close with a meditation. <laughs> May I ask, after 33 years of practicing this, do you still find it alive and living and continuing to stimulate you in a positive way? Joan is asking if after it's actually 37 years of practicing this now. I'm a little reluctant to admit that because I feel I should be an angel by now. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, is it still alive and, and positive in, influence in my life? I would say more so than ever, actually. Um, the, it's, it's sometimes referred to as a pilgrimage, this, this uh, journey of spiritual awakening. And um, there are, when you begin, uh, if it touches your heart, as it did mine, then there's a sort of great joy at some new hope, some new way forward. Uh, but then gradually you set, settle down to the recognition that you do have a loss of freedom. You're, you've got these prison officers inside your head that are making you behave in ways that are not in line with these deeper truths, you know, selfishness and greed and these things. And um, so there's a battle. There's a battle that takes place inside. But um, as time goes on and um, you start to see some progress in the battle, it's not that it's finished, it's probably lifelong, but, but as you see some attainments emerging from this and you realise that you are free in ways that you weren't previously, your enthusiasm grows hugely. And there are other aspects to it, and I'm, I hope that this will be, this little taster may encourage viewers to go deeper into it because there are deeper aspects to it relating to the divine dimension of things that are very empowering also and bring great joy when you understand these things. So no, I've been finding that um, the, last, the last four or five years especially, I've been feeling a great sense of joy coming through and a renewed enthusiasm after being on the battlefield for all these years. <laughs> It's not that uh, it's still the battles come, but uh, but it's 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 there is attainment. It was a nice uh, thing I came across from uh, about the Buddha recently, where someone, uh, a passing Hindu priest, said to the Buddha, 
are you a are you a, a, a deity a, a spirit or god and um the buddha said i'm none of those i'm awake <laughs> <laughs> it's a process though it, i mean you do catch it you and i hope that you know if we do a little meditation to close i hope it might touch you um but um it can happen in a second that you awaken but then to stay awake is the journey so let's close with um a bit of meditation along the lines that i've been learning it we in the community that I've practiced this with, we tend to do it with eyes open, which is unusual, but I found it very helpful right from the beginning because it means that rather than cutting yourself off from your environment, you're learning how to live within the environment, but with a different awareness. So you may like to try that. Although if you're uncomfortable, then closing your eyes is fine. I've shared a lot of words, but in the end, it's something that is wordless, actually. We build words around it to try to communicate, but those eternal truths, as that statement put it, that connect with the inner being, Words are inadequate to convey the experience. Nevertheless, as I move into deepening my own experience of that inner beauty, I'll try to put a few words to it. There's a sweetness to it, a kind of substance that is almost magical. It's spiritual, but it, it's experienced in the body. I can almost taste it. Sometimes there's goose pimples of happiness as I reconnect with this inner awareness. It puts me in the driver's seat. I realize that I am a being of consciousness, of conscient energy. I'm not this brain and body. They're hugely precious to me because they're like a vehicle with me as the driver. But whereas everything in the physical world is here today and gone tomorrow. The soul truly is eternal. It has a part within the scheme of things that is outside time and space. When it plays the part moment by moment, that's within the time and space of the play that is unfolding, but if you can step back from the ups and downs, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, step back from that and connect with this eternal truth about the inner being, it puts you on the path towards real freedom. You realize that you don't have to be a victim of adverse circumstances or hostility or unkindness. You don't have to be a slave to your own limited tendencies. I take my attention inside. It's as if 
the brain and the body melt away and I'm aware of myself as a like a star a tiny point dimensionless and outside time radiant with some kind of spiritual energy which enables me to play the parts that I do here on the stage of the world but is not the same as those so I value life I value my body I value my relationships I value everything about this amazing world we live in but I stop identifying with it because that shift in my sense of who I am away from even my own thoughts that are whirring in my brain into this timeless being of the soul this shift is hugely empowering I realize that I am at root a being of peace. And that actually is the meaning of an expression that is sometimes used within the Raja Yoga community that I've been practicing with all these years, Om Shanti. It means I am a timeless, eternal being of peace. That reality is always waiting for us. We just have to open the doors of perception on Shanti.